during the break, um, I had a question that was really asking about hearing the, the difference between hearing the Holy Spirit and hearing the ego. How tricky that can be. Um, how we could say that the ego is ingenious, so it, it, it will masquerade it will, as if it's the Holy Spirit. And then you follow what you hear, and then you have a very dark, fearful experience, and you've sowed and reaped fear, <laughs> but you thought you weren't. You thought you were listening to authentic guidance. So this topic is really a topic of discernment, and it's an enormous topic. You could do lots of retreats. Um, people know me, I do retreats. Uh, the longest retreat I've done is six weeks. Imagine coming to a six-week retreat with me. I showed a lot of movies, we, we had a lot of deep experiences on an island off the coast of Spain, Mallorca. And there was a four-week and a six-week, but, but it's, it's discernment is a very deep topic. On the most basic level, how do you feel is, is the answer to which one you're, le you're listening to. But also the ego has invented a whole feel-good repertoire of, of different emotions that feel good in its system and really are part of the death wish. Mm -hmm. So that's what the Course calls attraction to guilt. You know, you know the ego has to be pretty clever if it's, if it's attracting you to guilt, to keep you stuck in guilt, and using things of the world as part of alluring <laughs> ways to stay stuck in that guilt. That's why it takes a lot of discernment. So then the follow-up question, we, another question was raised too, was um, what if, I, I mean I'm, I'm tuning into the Spirit and I'm hearing things, but what if I hear it and I go, that's ridiculous. Uh, because, you remember, the world is a world of guilt and pain and shame and fear, and the unwinding from it, uh, the Holy Spirit and Jesus will ask you to do things that oftentimes the Spirit just judges as plain ridiculous. Part of the ridiculousness in this whole thing is the sense that the ego has made up a hierarchy of illusions. It's turned the whole cosmic image and all the images into a hierarchy. So part of that hierarchy of illusions are major decisions and minor decisions. A minor decision might be what what kind of, what color of shirt or blouse or pair of pants you're going to wear, uh, or what kind of food you're going to have for breakfast or lunch. A major decision would be a life partner, picking a life partner, um, or, and we'll talk a little bit about that too, but, or this leaving jobs, leaving, switching careers, um, um, or decisions that you have to make around terminal illness diagnosed with cancer or something like that. Those are more considered the major decisions. The more you go down into the miracle, which shows you that there is no order of difficulty in miracles and no hierarchies of, of illusion, you start to really get a sense that there really aren't major decisions and minor decisions. You may be guided in terms of a life partner, like uh, Armel who was with me and, and this other man, uh, Eric, who had worked with me. She'd come over from Belgium, Canada, and down to Cincinnati. And I was out in, at the monastery in uh, Utah, and Armel got clear guidance to marry a man that she had not met in 15 days. Now, that would probably go into the category of Ridiculous. In fact, uh, that's after Armel called and talked to me and said that she was kind of trembling at the time, like, I'm hearing that I'm supposed to marry Eric, this man Eric, who she'd never met. She'd seen a picture on the internet, but had never met him in 15 days. So she joined with me and I felt the confirmation from the Holy Spirit. And you should have seen the look on Eric's face. <laughs> I, I did get to see the look on Eric's face when I said, go get Eric. And when he came in and, and the phone went to his ear, and I just got to watch his face just, just 
You know, you've heard of arranged marriages like in India, where the families get together. This is Holy Spirit matchmaking. And there's a real important purpose behind it, because it's undoing the ego. It's a major purpose, because relationships involve mirroring, and the Spirit knows. Some of you read Absence from Felicity, that Ken wrote, uh, that Bill Thetford and Helen Shuckman had what, what Jesus called complementary ego dynamics. <laughs> Isn't that a fascinating phrase from Jesus? Complementary ego dynamics. In other words, ooh, put these two together and there's going to be like a really swift undoing. <laughs> because, you know, there, it's, the Holy Spirit uses contrast. When you're so addicted to misery, you're going to have to have some contrast experiences that are going to pop you out of it. So, that's an example. I mean, being guided to marry a man that you haven't met in 15 days. And the thing was, Eric had been part of a devotional with us, where he went through a lot of deep undoings over a period of, of weeks. And then, at the very end of the devotional, we, we tune into the Holy Spirit, and we just listen and pray for next steps. One of Eric's next steps at the end of this, so many week devotional was to break up with his girlfriend. But he didn't follow it. So, it was an interesting proposal to get a marriage proposal and have a girlfriend. And the marriage proposal did not come from the girlfriend. It came from our mouth. I said, now you see what I mean. You've got to follow the spirit because it's conflictual if you don't follow the instructions. It would be like trying to bake a cherry pie and leaving the cherries out of the cherry pie. You can't really bake a cherry pie without the cherries. So that's one example and, and there I could give you lots and lots of examples. I'll give an example from the parable of David. A friend of mine many years ago um, was a Course in Miracles student and my girlfriend from Michigan, Janie, and we took some guided tours with the Holy Spirit here and there, this and that. We came back around to Cincinnati and we were praying in Cincinnati and we were just tuning in and listening to the Holy Spirit and Jesus and, and we started feeling like we were going to be taking a trip out west. It started coming really strong. So it's coming in stronger, stronger. You hit a feeling, yeah, we're going, we're going west, we're going west. We're going out, you know, I-70 across it was coming in stronger and stronger, go west, go out by 70. But before we left, we were in Cincinnati, and the Holy Spirit said, I am the destination, and I will tell you the direction. And at that point, I had been on a lot of guided trips. Go here, go there, do this, do that, go here. I mean, I had already done many, 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 many guided trips, many miracles too. So I was really on my magic carpet ride, just flying with the Holy Spirit. And then, and then we're praying and it's like, I am the destination and I will tell you the direction. And I told Janie, I said, this is going to be real interesting. I've never gone on a trip with those kind of instructions. I am the destination, I will tell you the direction. So off we go, we're going through Indiana, Illinois, we're going out through Missouri, we're heading out west, you know, driving across the United States, the Great Plains, you know, we get driving, and we're talking, talking, we're talking about Colorado and, you know, and California, and we're talking about these future hypothetical thoughts, you know, but really the lesson is, I am the, the, the destination, I will tell you the direction. So we get out to Kansas. Has anybody driven through Kansas? Yeah. It's like, it's flat and it's like, there's nothing there. You know, it's just wheat fields and corn fields and fields and fields. You drive, 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 drive. So we're driving there. And we got to the point where it started to get a little bit later in the day. It's, Jesus is like, pull over, get a motel room, da da da. We do that. The next morning we get up and I go, and I'm just having my meditation. And I'm meditating, and, and then I hear Jesus saying, Go east. And I'm like, What? <laughs> you, you, you can't possibly have driven <laughs> out to the middle of Kansas thinking about 
Colorado and California, all the fun ocean beaches. And you got me in the middle of Kansas, and now, and then the, the other thing was, it was like, how am I going to tell her, you know, this, is, this is going to be the end of the relationship. You, know, you get some wacko guy that's driving out in the middle of Kansas, and then you get go east. So it was like, it was share the guy that's doing it. I'm not, I'm not going to share that, no. And so she's up and getting ready, we all get together, we get in the car, we come, we drive, start driving towards the interstate highway, we're getting closer and closer, and I'm like thinking, i got to share this, i got to, so we get closer and closer, we stop at a red light, and we're just about to the interstate, and I've got Jesus telling me to go east, and she's sitting in the passenger side, and I'm just looking at her, and she just got, her face just totally lit up in total joy, like a little five-year-old girl. And she looked over at me from the passenger side. She said, are you hearing what I'm hearing? <laughs> <laughs> Saved <laughs> by the grace of God. <laughs> and I said, I think so. What are you hearing? And she's like, <laughs> still holding back <laughs> until the last second. She said, I'm hearing, go east. And I'm like, go east, ah. And we, we, I pulled off onto the ramp and we started heading east and it was like we were in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. I thought the car was going to like go off. Huh? Huh? Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. You know, the car, you remember, Dick Van Dyke up into the sky. That's how it felt because it was one of those moments where it was all about guidance. It was like, it was really about being true to the guidance. Let go of all your preconceptions. And I use that example because, again, that would be in the ridiculous category. To drive all the way from Cincinnati to, to Kansas, and then to stay in a motel and turn around and drive <laughs> back east. You know, like, this is the crazy wisdom, you know, the crazy wisdom teachers. But, but this is what we're dealing with. That when you start to unwind from the thinking of the world, you really have to tune in and you really have to be open. What's the, te what's the tenth characteristic of a teacher of God? It starts off with trust, but number ten is open-mindedness. Perhaps, he says, the last one to come in. You see, you have to let go of all judgment of what you think everything means, and, and be totally willing to look like a fool to the ego. And believe me, this guidance has been this way over the years. I've had to look like a fool. People laugh at me all the time. They burst out laughing for 15, 20 minutes, a half an hour. Because they think he's just clueless, but it's foolish, but he's, he's gonna, you know, just like putting on a hat, like I'm determined, my Holy Spirit cap, you know, like, come on, let's go. We're going back to heaven here. Let's get the hat on and go for it, you know? Let's really, here, you got your hat on. And you asked me the question about the ridiculousness. We're going for it. So, so really, you start to realize in so many ways that we work with people on a daily basis that are being, receiving guidance, and it sometimes involves leaving jobs, leaving partners, leaving children. It can involve relocating, it can involve, um, you know, a what would, people would call major, major life changes. And we join in prayer and really tune in and hear it because, again, the ridiculous temptation can come in there with some of these prompts from the Holy Spirit. It's unwinding you from a crazy thought system.